I'm Heidi Henderson, the Fossil Huntress, and your host for BC's Fossil Bounty. Join in the exploration of the fascinating science of paleontology, that lens that examines ancient animals, plants, and ecosystems, from wee single-cell organisms to big and mighty dinosaurs. Hello and welcome. My name is John Clegg. I'm an emeritus professor in the Department of Earth Sciences at Simon Fraser University and a geologist who really knows BC geology well. And I love the geology of this province. I want to share with you the bounty that we have of fossils in this province. Meet Dr. John Clegg, geologist, professor emeritus at Simon Fraser University, Order of Canada, and one of Canada's leading authorities in environmental earth science. We only need to think of the loss of large sections of our highways to consider the power of nature and the vision required to mitigate that risk. His work has brought to our attention that and so much more. How will Vancouver fare in an earthquake? How on earth did we build houses in communities on sand? For that, it is folk like Dr. Clegg we turn to. The wealth of plants and animals that constitute our geologic record, that tell us so much about past environments and climates. We're gonna explore BC's beautiful geography. We're gonna look at the processes that have operated to produce the landscape that we see today that create this wonderland of coastline, mountains, glaciers, volcanoes. We are going to do this by using the fossil record as a entry point into better understanding how the province that we live in came to be as we see it today. What appears to be a static landscape is actually a dynamic landscape that has evolved. We have a record of events in British Columbia that extend back hundreds of millions of years. The fossil record provides a record of evolution uh, over a very long period of time. Scientists, paleontologists use fossils not only to date events in geologic time, but it also allows us to say something about what climatic conditions were like when these animals and plants lived. The fossil record helps us understand that because we can use the fossils to date geologic events. What this record tells us is that we live in a dynamic landscape. Sometimes we don't appreciate how dynamic it is. Earthquakes, volcanic eruptions give hints to us that this landscape is very active. On a daily basis, and even over this period of an individual's life, we don't often appreciate the changes that take place beneath our feet. But we know that plates are moving on the surface of the planet and that over geologic time, these plates rearrange themselves. We have plates that are colliding with one another. Sometimes one plate moves down beneath another. Sometimes plates slide past one another as they do in California to produce very large earthquakes. So if we take this back in time, we can see how much change there has been. Our landscape is really the end product of these dynamic processes that operate at small scale but over long periods of time totally changed the surface of the planet. Another example that we're going to deal with is fossils that date to a period of geologic time that 
postdates the dinosaurs after the dinosaurs became extinct, but not by much. So this was a period we call the Eocene epoch. Eocene really means the dawn of modern animals. This is a period that geologists recognize as being relatively recent. Now you might not consider 50 million years ago recent, but when you have a planet that is 4.6 billion years old, that is a very small part of that time. And the Eocene was a time when we had subtropical forests in what is now the south coastal part of British Columbia. So we had palms, we had large ferns. Imagine going to the tropics, having this, this very interesting flora that we have preserved as fossils around Vancouver. But it also was a time of intense warmth. Uh, this period geologically was one of the warmest periods in recent Earth history, going back hundreds of millions of years. Average temperatures globally in the Eocene were 13 degrees above what they are today. There was no ice on the planet. There was no Antarctic ice sheet. There was no Greenland ice sheet. There were no mountain glaciers, no ice whatsoever. It was just too warm to have what we call a cryosphere, a frozen part of the planet. And as a result, all that what is now ice would have been in the oceans as water and would have caused sea level to be probably about 70 meters higher during the Eocene than it is today. Today, we have a lot of water locked up in ice sheets and glaciers, which keeps sea level lower than it would otherwise be. So we live in a special place. British Columbia is located at the margin of a very large fragment of the outer crust of the Earth. Geologists call this the North America Plate. The North America Plate rests on what we call the mantle. And the mantle is very hot. If you go down to depths of 10, 20, 30 kilometers below Earth's surface, temperatures are hundreds of degrees warmer than they are at the Earth's surface. And at those depths, the rocks are no longer brittle. They behave like taffy almost. They're in plastic materials that slowly deform and move. And what we now know is a result of the plate tectonic revolution, which was the most important revolution in thinking in earth science that occurred about 50, 60 years ago. We now know that these plates are moving around on the surface at rates that might seem trivial, they're typically rates of centimeters per year, but if you extend that over long periods of time, you have very large displacements of the outer crust of the Earth. The outer crust of the Earth is broken into fragments, and as I mentioned, the North America plate is one of the largest of those fragments, and we here on the south coast lie at the very edge of that plate. And offshore, beneath the North Pacific Ocean, we have other plates that are independent of the North America plate. The one that really drives what we see happening around us on the south coast is called the Juan de Fuca plate. And this is a plate that underlies the seafloor that extends from central Vancouver Island on the north all the way down to Northern California, a distance of about a thousand kilometers. And this plate is moving up against North America. It is a heavier, more dense plate than the North American plate. So when it encounters the North American plate, it slides beneath it. This is a process that we call subduction. Now we can go back in time and see that this relatively small plate, the Juan de Fuca plate, is a remnant of a much, much larger oceanic plate that geologists call the Farallon plate. The Farallon plate was also subducting or moving beneath the outer coast of North America and has for over a hundred million years. And so what we've had along our shoreline extending back a hundred million years is this process of subduction where one plate drives up against another and moves down beneath it. The Farallon plate had a bunch of brittle crustal fragments sitting on it that were kind of going along for the ride over this hundred million year period. And these fragments were derived from a distant locations. We think these fragments actually originated 
in what is now the South Pacific. And these fragments of different sizes came along on top of the Farallon Plate and then encountered North America and became attached to North America. And you can imagine the force that resulted from the accretion of these crustal fragments on the Farallon Plate with ancestral North America. And what we now know is that much of British Columbia is an amalgam of these crustal fragments that has been created over the past 100 million years, a process that is still going on with the Juan de Fuca Plate. These fragments are separated from one another. Geologists can identify them because of their unique characteristics, including the fossils that some of the sedimentary rocks that constitute the fragments are present in. That helps us to understand this past history. Much of British Columbia, the mountains, the valleys, they are formed on these uh, fragments that have come up to and docked against North America over the past 100 million years. That creates the mountains and the valleys we see. You can imagine that the forces are compressional as one plate moves up against another one and it creates stresses that ultimately cause the crust of North America to be elevated and to be displaced along faults. So this process of plate accretion that's been happening for so long has not only created the topography, but it has generated millions of earthquakes and created volcanic eruptions due to the passage of magma from deep within the crust up to the Earth's surface. And we see those rocks in the landscape of the province today. Big episodes of volcanic activity, the Eocene, for example, when there was a tremendous amount of volcanic activity there. There are rocks all through southern BC that are volcanic in origin that date to this period. We also have a legacy of volcanic rocks that date to the Miocene period, which is much more recent in time and ended about seven million years ago. So much of our landscape is underlain by rocks that have formed as a result of the collision of these offshore plates, the Farallon Plate and the Juan de Fuca Plate against North America. We see the results of these collisions when we look at the Vancouver area. Vancouver sits at the western edge of British Columbia, a province built from island chains that have ridden those crustal plates. To the north and southwest are the high peaks of the coast and Cascade Mountains, born of colliding crustal plates, then carved and eroded smooth by glaciers and streams that carve the deep valleys you and I walk today. Today's peaceful landscape has been shaped by a violent past. Earthquakes, volcanoes, and massive glaciation. Beneath our feet are ice age and modern sediments. And there once was a time not so long ago when a postcard of Vancouver would have looked more like our polar regions and a time further back again when there was no ice on the planet at all. The mountain landscape has been also modified during a remarkable period of Earth history that we call the Pleistocene or the Ice Ages. Beginning about three million years ago, climate began to oscillate radically. We had periods when glaciers built up in British Columbia and formed an ice sheet that enveloped all of the province. Most recently, about 25,000 to 11,000 years ago, the Cordilleran Ice Sheet. The last one was only one of many that covered the province during the ice ages of the Pleistocene. These glaciers and ice sheets modified our landscape. We have the legacy of glacial erosion in our landscape. If you look at our southern coast mountains, for example, we see that the valleys and the divides between ranges have been sculpted by glaciers. You wouldn't think that a glacier could erode rock, but it's really the debris that is being transported as the glacier moves over the rock beneath it that scours it like sandpaper rubbing up against wood. And over periods of thousands of years, this actually transforms a mountain landscape into one that we recognize as having experienced 
glaciation. We have some of the finest examples of glacier features in British Columbia in the world. An example are our fjords. These are indentations along the coast. They're inlets that extend from the outer coast considerable distances inland into the coast mountains that have been over deepened by glaciers. They're old river valleys that have been tremendously deepened by ancient glaciers that no longer exist. And our fjords, Bude Inlet, Night Inlet, for example, rival those in Norway, uh, in Greenland, and Antarctica. We have some of the most beautiful fjords, the most wonderful legacy of glaciation in the world. Remarkably, these glaciers have deepened these old ancient river valleys up to 700 meters or more in some instances. The last period of glaciation in British Columbia began about 30,000 years ago. At that time, we saw the climate of the Pacific Northwest getting colder and probably wetter. And a result over periods of hundreds to maybe several thousand years was that glaciers, which prior to the last glacial period were pretty well confined to our high mountains, Coast Mountains, the Rocky Mountains, Caribou Mountains, they began to advance, their fronts began to extend down into areas where we don't have glaciers today. So our plateau area in the interior and our lowland areas along the coast increasingly became covered by ice. And this was a product of the cooling of climate that we see globally during the last glacial cycle. And ultimately, glaciers from different mountain sources coalesced over the interior and coalesced over what was then the Strait of Georgia and covered almost all of the province. There may have been a few ice-free areas at the last glacial peak for example, close to the Queen Charlotte Islands or Haida Gwaii, and possibly off parts of the west coast of Vancouver Island. But otherwise, the entire province was enveloped in ice. And at the last glacial maximum, which we date to about 17,000 years ago, the ice sheet extended southward in the Puget Lowland all the way down to Olympia, Washington, so a couple hundred kilometers south of Vancouver. There were lobes of the same ice sheet to the east that extended down into Washington and Idaho. Glaciers also advanced out onto the British Columbia Continental Shelf and finally uh, covered much of northern British Columbia and even extended into southern Yukon Territory. So you can envision this massive sheet of ice up to about three kilometers thick covering all of British Columbia. What is now Vancouver was covered by two kilometers of ice. It's hard to appreciate how different that environment was from what it is today. The ice sheet persisted at its peak for a relatively short period of time, maybe a thousand years, and then climate began to warm. We got this reversal of climate and the ice sheet began to thin and recede back at the margins. So as it was doing this, what is now the Strait of Georgia, Salish Sea, and the Fraser Lowland east of Vancouver progressively were deglaciated. Vegetation became established on the new ice-free surfaces, and we actually have a record of that vegetation in our fossil record. There are plants that exist today associated with a cooler, climate than we see today. The other remarkable thing is that this ice sheet actually depressed the crust that it sat on. Hard to believe, but when you get two kilometers of ice sitting on the crust, it actually pushes the crust down. It deforms the crust because the crust itself sits on a mantle which is taffy-like. Mantle material moves slowly away from the point of loading and the crust is lowered many hundreds of meters below where it is today. And as the ice sheet retreated back and marine waters came into Puget Sound, Juan de Fuca Strait, and the Strait of Georgia or Salish Sea, the crust was still pushed down. And as a result, marine waters flooded that depressed surface. 
and formed an embayment that extended right across Metro Vancouver all the way to Chilliwack. So that was an arm of the Paleo Salish Sea that developed on this depressed crust. There were marine organisms, mollusks, that lived in that sea at the time that this marine embayment existed. And we have marine sediments that actually have contained these mollusks that look remarkably like marine mollusks that exist along the seashore today. But they occur up to about 200 meters above sea level. And I have had friends who live in places like Langley and Aldergrove who have found marine fossils in their yards. They found these beautiful white shells, these mollusk shells and snail shells, and they can't understand how in the world they occur where they do so far from the present day seashore. In reality, they date back to the period that the last ice sheet was retreating away and this inundation of the sea occurred in the Fraser Valley that allowed the sea to extend to where my friends live today. And they are recovering these 14,000 year old marine fossils. Sometimes they have trouble believing that these date to that time, but we have techniques that allow us to date these fossils very precisely. One is a carbon dating technique, which we've used to date fossil snails and fossil shells that we find all through the Fraser Lowland, up to, as I mentioned, elevations of about 200 meters. Our province is a treasure trove of fossils. Ammonites, trilobites, marine reptiles, dinosaurs, insect and plant fossils are all around us. We have a huge number of fossil sites in British Columbia, from the southern tip of the province to our very northern parts. If you head out in the field, you can find clams and snails and even bird fossils from Souk near Victoria that are more than 25 million years old. We have plants across the province, and these range in age from relatively recent to 65 million years ago, a time when the dinosaurs were still alive. Up in the Kootenays, we have the lower Cambrian fossils of the Eager Formation at the Rifle Range site and others that are just a shade older than the Burgess Shale. I'd like to share with you a few of the very famous fossil localities that we have in this province. First of all, we have the Tumbler Ridge UNESCO Geopark site. This is one of, I believe, two in Canada, and it has these amazing dinosaur tracks that date back to more than 70 million years ago. It also has fossil bone beds, dinosaur bone beds, and a variety of other fossilized animals that uh, you can't help but marvel at. What a different world BC was when the dinosaurs roamed what is now the province. A site on Vancouver Island called the Puntledge River. It's near Courtney and it has one of the most amazing fossils I've ever seen. It's called an elasmosaur. It was found in rocks along the Puntledge River and is now in the museum in Courtney. This animal was a marine reptile and it lived during the Cretaceous period, same time as the dinosaurs. It was a scary animal. It was a long marine reptile with a very small head, but it had choppers you wouldn't believe. The teeth on this animal were razor sharp and it was swimming around in the oceans looking for things to eat. And I think it really puts the old great white shark to shame. It gives you a flavor of what lived in the seas in what is now British Columbia more than 70 million years ago. When this province was covered by glaciers during periods as the glaciers were growing or wasting away, we had large mammals that were roaming what is now the Vancouver area, the Victoria area, and these include things like bison, mammoths, mastodons. Can you just envision that, you know, having these giant paleo elephants wandering around this landscape as recently as about 20,000 years ago? And that geologically is a drop in the bucket. It's very, very recent. This happened, of course, when the climate was very, very different from what it was during the Cretaceous. 
when the dinosaurs and the elasmosaurs lived and give you some sense for the immensity of geologic time. What we find in British Columbia are little snippets of geologic history, both ancient and, in the case of the mammoths, some that are pretty recent in terms of their antiquity. And that tells us so much about how this landscape formed, how British Columbia came to be what it is. I'm aware that fossils are fascinating to people of all ages. Children I teach, they find dinosaurs and other types of fossils that we have in British Columbia quite amazing. It's a wonderful topic to engage the interest of young people. From the perspective of an adult, we can use fossils to better understand the panoply of geologic history that our province has been through. This serves as geologic sleuthing. I'm very interested in better understanding how our present landscape has been created slowly over a period of millions and millions of years as a result of processes such as plate tectonics, glaciation, erosion by rivers. All these processes have shaped what we see around us today. And it gives one an appreciation of the outdoors. We can ask questions that we would, might not otherwise ask just from the physical evidence of these past processes. We can ask ourselves, well, how do volcanoes fit into this story? Or we know we have glaciers in our mountains, so were our glaciers more extensive in the past? What does that tell us about climate? It just opens up a universe of interesting topics that help us to better understand our planet. Dr. Clegg has gifted us with more than 30 years of terrain mapping, stratigraphic investigations, engineering and environmental interpretations of geologic information and natural hazard studies. His work is local, national and international and impacts us on the global stage. His work helps us to understand the natural processes that have sculpted our city, our province and our world. And he helps keep us safe Landslides, floodwaters, and rainwater put us at risk of washed out roads, highways, and houses. And when those things happen, it's to John Clegg we turn. It's his vision for a future, to build out our world and keep us safe. And for that, we thank him. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode of BC's Fossil Bounty. I'm Heidi Henderson, the Fossil Huntress.